covering our second segment in the workbook of what is a man. Esta noche estamos repasando el segundo segmento del capítulo 6 de que, del manual de qué es un hombre. We are going to spend some unordinary extra time. Vamos a pasar tiempo eh, de más o, o extra. In this particular realm because this is the cornerstone of everything we build. En este estudio porque esta es la piedra angular de todo lo que estamos edificando. The weight and responsibility of the entire building is on the cornerstone that is laid. El peso y la responsabilidad de todo el edificio depende de la piedra angular. The size of the building, the extent of the structure will be determined by the cornerstone that is Laid. El tamaño y eh, la, la amplitud del edificio depende de la piedra angular que se establece. I share the story of when God called us to start Spring of Life, this church. Yo comparto la historia de que cuando Dios nos llamó a comenzar esta iglesia. Um, I don't know if you could relate to this. How many baseball players? Yo no sé si ustedes pueden relacionarse con esto. ¿Cuántos peloteros tenemos? You're in training to be the second base to the New York Yankees. Está siendo entrenado para jugar segunda base para los Yankees. There's certain elements that you need to perfect. Y hay ciertos elementos que tú tienes que perfeccionar. Catching a ground ball is one of those elements. Eh, agarrar un roletazo es uno de esos elementos. If every uh, grounder that comes in your direction goes through your legs and you miss it with the glove, si tú fallas de agarrar todo cada roletazo que te llega you know you cannot man that post tú sabes que no puedes tomar esa posición if you're running back and you fumble you can't be the running back of the team si juegas fútbol americano y dejas la pelota caer no te van a dar la posición de correr con I've, la pelota I've gone to the last couple of Marlin games yo he ido a, a los últimos juegos de los Marlins and I see the infielders standing in front of this ball that's going a hundred miles an hour y yo veo los de medio campo que están parados eh, de una pelota que va a 100 millas por hora. almost like picking their nose. Y es casi como sacar su moco. They do it without... <laughs> that's fine. Um, that's descriptive, but that's fine. Picking their nose. <laughs> Any other translation? Um, they do it second nature. It's not without thinking. Their, their glove is on the ball and they're scooping it up and it looks easy. Lo hacen como de instinto. Ni siquiera lo tienen que pensar. But we Le know that the common person cannot stand in front of that ball and even think about dropping the glove you're thinking about getting out of the way ellos lo hacen ver fácil pero una persona no entrenada ni siquiera piensa en poner el guante sino eh, 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 evadir. evadir la que no le golpee and la so pelota when the Lord called us to start a church Así que cuando el Señor nos llamó a comenzar una iglesia, I was 30 years old. yo tenía 30 años. I had a one year old son, a two year old son, and a three year old son. Tenía, tenía un hijo de un año, dos años y tres años. I had a lot of responsibilities professionally as a lawyer. Y tenía muchas responsabilidades profesionalmente como abogado. And when the Lord says, now is the time y cuando, to begin a ministry, y cuando el Señor me dijo, ahora es el tiempo de comenzar un ministerio, my first impression was, wait a second. Mi primer reacción fue, espérate. I need more practice. Yo necesito practicar más. I need to get more grounders. Uh, me tienen que tirar más roletazos. Because now you're going to the stadium to play in front of 20,000 people. Porque ahora vas a un estadio a jugar delante de 20,000 personas. Now it's no more practice. Ya no estás practicando más. Now responsibility has arrived. Ahora ha llegado la responsabilidad. And I felt like a second baseman who goofed off at practice. Y yo me sentí como un alguien que jugaba segunda base y no estaba prestando atención durante In la práctica. In my development, en mi desarrollo, I didn't take it as serious as I would have if I knew I was being called to the front office. Yo no lo tomé tan en serio como lo hubiera tomado si hubiese si sabía que me iban a llamar a jugar profesional. To be the starting second baseman of the New York Yankees. Para ser el eh, de, de segunda base de los Yankees. I said no, I'm still in the farm team's amateur league and I'm just practicing. No, yo de, mi respuesta era no, yo todavía estoy en las ligas menores practicando. And the Lord said no. Y el Señor dijo no. It's real time. Ahora es eh, las grandes ligas. And now is your your the starter. 
tú vas a jugar en las grandes ligas ahora. So when you're called up to responsibility, Así que cuando te llaman a la responsabilidad, what is most seen is your irresponsibility. lo que se va a ver va a ser tu irresponsabilidad. ¿Cuántos saben que es más fácil estar en las gradas diciendo... Oye, Necio, ¿por qué no agarraste esa pelota? We went to Mexico. Fuimos a México. And Pastor Medieros wanted me to see the Michael Jordan of all bullfighters in the world. Y el Pastor Medieros quería que yo viera el mejor eh, torero de todo el mundo. His name was El Juli. Su nombre era El Juli. He was, young, he was the youngest bullfighter. Y era eh, el torero más joven. He was the Michael Jordan of bullfighters. Él era el Michael Jordan de los toreros. And in this particular bullfighting ring, it is small, only fits 5,000 people. Y en este pequeño estadio, eh, solo te, eh, había espacio para 5,000 personas. In the big stadiums, it's 80,000 people. En los estadios grandes, son 80,000 personas. So 5,000 people fit into a little bullfighting ring. Así que 5,000 personas caben en un estadio de eh, corrida de toros and this 3000 pound bull came out y este toro de 3000 libras sale and el juli was out there fighting the bull y el juli estaba toreando el toro and some guy behind me says y alguien detrás de mí dijo get closer acércate más and el juli heard him y el Juli lo escuchó. And he says, you come down here, you idiot. Y le dijo, Haz, bájate tú y hazlo tú. You take responsibility. Tú toma la responsabilidad. You man the post. Tú toma el lugar. Because one thing is to be sitting down. Porque una cosa es sentarte. And another thing is to be responsible. Y otra cosa es ser responsable. And so that's why we're focusing tonight. Y por eso estamos enfocándonos esta I noche. I hope that there's not one man here that does not think that you're not called to do something important for God. Yo espero que no haya nadie en este lugar que no piense que Dios lo ha llamado a hacer algo importante para Dios. Y ese día it's going to require something called faithfulness. va a requerir algo que se llama fidelidad. And faithfulness is the character of Christ. Y la fidelidad es el carácter de Cristo. He's not calling you up to drop the ball. Él no te está llamando para dejar caer la pelota. Or let the grounder go through your legs. Ni dejar que el roletazo pase por tus piernas. Because that will cost the life or death of a family. Porque esa va a causar la muerte, va a ser la vida o la muerte de una familia. That will cause the life or the death of a marriage. Va a causar la vida o la muerte de un matrimonio. So Father, tonight, Así que, Padre, esta noche, we pray oramos that the Spirit of God de Dios will minister to our spirit and awaken our lives up y despierte nuestra vida to be faithful men para ser hombres fieles in this generation en esta generación, at this hour en esta hora, for your glory. Para tu gloria. In Jesus' name we pray. En el de Jesús Let's break up into our groups. Vamos a reunirnos en nuestros grupos. Amen. Amen. Right before you guys hung up, yeah, yeah, man, I'm out in the Africa on that call. Oh, okay. I pretty much got everything. No. I miss.
testing, testing. Can you hear me? Yeah, a little bit. Do you want me to sit in this one or do you want me to sit in another one? Go to another one. Go to another one. Any in particular? Mm, use your judgment. Okay. The idea is. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Let Kenny, yeah. you gonna come in soon or? George Smith is coming in here? Yes, yeah, yeah. I know he's here. Doing the books. Okay. okay. All right. So let's start on page 67. Um, page 67, we're in chapter 6, uh, segment 2, the calamity of unfaithful man. So segment 1. was called faithfulness. Segment two is the calamity of an unfaithful man. Somebody could read Proverbs 2.22. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. Amen. Uh, unfortunately, if you travel anywhere, let's get the door open. Fortunately, everywhere you go, it's much more common to see unfaithful men than to see faithful men. Matter of fact, the level of unfaithfulness is alarming. Uh, Pastor Kenny Luck has said that every ruin upon the earth, everything that you see that's out of order and out of place on earth, everything that's in ruin is the result of an unfaithful man. It's a result of man not doing what God has put, on, put him on the earth to do. If you look at your life and you look around you, everything that you see that is out of order, that is out of place, that's in ruin, that's in, uh, that's neglected, is the result of a man not doing what he's supposed to, not doing what God has called him to do. And so in your own life, identify who that man is. In other words, the areas in, that are, the things that you see around you that are out of order, that are out of place, identify who's the man responsible. Who's the man that God is calling to bring those things in order? Because God called man the bible says god blessed man the bible says he made man in his image and likeness and he gave him rule over all the earth over the works of god's hands god gave us as men responsibility over all creation we're supposed to rule over we're supposed to set creation in order and so as you look around you can identify those things that are out of order and you can know that it's a man's responsibility to put them into order. The earth has been populated with unfaithful men who've abandoned their call to faithfulness. You've been called to faithfulness. You've 
being called to call men to faithfulness. You are to be a faithful man. And you're to teach others how to be faithful. You're to model faithfulness. And you're to hold others accountable to being faithful. Whoever looks in this present generation, you will see the calamity of unfaithful man everywhere. Unwanted pregnancies, divorce, abortion, high crime rates, scandal, devastation, political unrest, terrorism, government misappropriation. All of these things are the result of unfaithful men. Let's look at Ezekiel 15.8. Somebody read that. Thus I will make the land desolate, because they have acted unfaithfully, declares the Lord God. So the Lord stands against the unfaithful man. In other words, not only is the result of a man's unfaithfulness destruction, but God then stands against the unfaithful man. And the Bible says, he will make his land desolate. So God... <clears throat> chooses to either bless your land God makes your land fruitful or God makes your land desolate and he makes that decision based on whether you've acted faithfully or unfaithfully so many men most men spend their life working on making their land fruitful most men spend their life chasing after fruit but the Bible says the Lord makes your land fruitful and the Lord makes your land desolate and he does so based on the faithfulness of your character the reason we're focusing on faithfulness is because it's the cornerstone and we said this it was two weeks ago when we covered uh, the chapter faithfulness is the cornerstone of man's character <laughs> So there's only, we're, we're, we're purposely limiting our conversation and keeping it really simple tonight. We're purposely limiting our conversation to only two types of men. Faithful men and unfaithful men. There's only two types. And faithfulness is the cornerstone of man's character. What, why do we say cornerstone? What do we mean? A cornerstone is the stone upon which the rest of the building, it's the first stone that is laid upon which the rest of the building is built around. Wow. And so <clears throat> without faithfulness, you can't build. Your character cannot be built. You cannot continue to go on into maturity without laying a foundation of faithfulness. An unfaithful man, what does he look like? He shows forth cowardice, weakness of character, instability, spineless existence, resistance to order, treachery, infidelity. He compromises and becomes a catalyst to a degenerate existence. Taking on the character attributes of Satan himself, an unfaithful man becomes a blight to his family, his church, his community, leaving behind an atmosphere of confusion, of unfaithfulness, uncertainty, and selfish chaos. Such a man seems to walk and exist only to plunder the abundance of God's provision by his selfish, self-centered, sinister character. So, number one, God has called you to faithfulness. Number two, everything that is in ruin on earth this is just a summary of what we just read. Number one, God has called you to faithfulness. Number two, everything that is out of order and in desolation and ruin and neglected in this earth is because of an unfaithful man. A faithful man is the answer, is God's answer to ruin and desolation. So we're talking, we were talking about an unfaithful man, two types of men. One, the unfaithful man who plunders God's vast provision. He's the source. 
he's the responsible party to everything that's neglected and destroyed. A faithful man is God's answer. Whenever you look at something that's out of order, whenever you look at something in ruin, the answer is a faithful man. And so God has called you to step in. The Bible says we are uh, the salt of the earth. The Bible says that we're a, we are the light of the world. So God has called us to step into darkness, to step into disorder, to step into chaos and make it right. And to put things in order. And so the two types of men are the unfaithful man, which through his unfaithfulness causes calamity, causes desolation, causes chaos. And the other type of man is the faithful man, which brings peace, which brings joy, which brings God's order. John 10.10, 10. the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy the unfaithful man. The unfaithful man resembles the character of Satan. Steals, kills, and destroy. The Bible says a lazy man, something like the lazy man is brother of him who is a robber. If you're not diligent in what you do, you have the character similar to one who robs. You were called to be productive. You were called to be diligent. The Bible says, but I, Jesus, have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. There you have the, faith, the unfaithful comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's his legacy. That's what he leaves behind. The faithful man leaves behind life and life in abundance. Something that flourishes. Something where what you leave behind is greater than what you found, than what was there before you showed up. The unfaithful man <clears throat> plunders and destroys whatever, um, whatever he comes in contact with. A truly unfaithful man is unwelcome in any social circle. These weak-willed men are despised by women, resented by children, rejected by society. Because they profess to love, they enter into commitments, they profess authenticity. So faithfulness is not about words. It's about delivering on those words. And unfaithful men are unable to deliver on these realities. The appearance of an unfaithful man is able to sell personality but not deliver substance because of his ungodly character. The unfaithful man is quick to proclaim strength, depth of conviction, and sincerity of thoughts until he comes up against adversity, until he comes up against challenges, and then he abandons his commitments and shows his true lack of integrity. An unfaithful man is without character, unable to offer himself to serve others, not able to serve God, and as a result of his selfishness, will disintegrate beyond repair. Excuse me. The unfaithful man does not benefit from correction, wisdom, or instruction, and is headed to great destruction. God is willing to walk with a faithful man a thousand miles, but will not take a single step with an unfaithful man. So, the two points here are one, a unfaithful man causes destruction, and two, God stands against the unfaithful man. So it's a, it, there, there's two issues. One, your life, the, the consequences of an unfaithful man, are, or the fruit is destruction. And then on top of that, the Lord comes in and stands against him and doesn't allow him to prosper. 
The opposite of that is a faithful man. The Bible says a faithful man is guided by his integrity. A faithful man is not guided by money. A faithful man is not even guided by wisdom, it says. A faithful man is not guided by plans or wits. The Bible says the integrity of a faithful man. You know what that means? A faithful man does the right thing. Integrity means he does the right thing no matter what, even if it's to his loss. Watch this. A man of integrity will do what's right even if it's going to result in loss for him. But God stands with a faithful man. And so what a faithful man will lose by standing in his integrity, God will restore to him many times over. God will establish the man that walks in his integrity. The Bible says, but the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. So when you do the right thing, God will guide you. When you, do the, when you start to twist things, the Bible says it will destroy you. So many times, men are faced with a decision. And many times, there's the opportunity to twist things, to do things a little out of order, to do things a little out of place, which seem to benefit. The Bible says that will destroy them. The Bible says the unfaithful man takes that twisted path. And he says that, the, that that will destroy the unfaithful man. The perversity means the twisting. The twisting of what's right. There's a straight path and we twist it thinking that that twist is going to result in our advantage. But it results in our destruction. The Bible says when we allow integrity, when we allow righteousness to guide us, then the Lord stands with us to prosper us. Proverbs 29, 1 says, He who's often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed and without remedy. And Pastor brought up the, uh, the phrase or the phrases that he uses where he says that the opposite of destruction is instruction. And so a faithful man is able to walk in instruction. He's able to be faithful to the instruction he's been given. Whereas an unfaithful man is unable to obey instruction. He's unable to walk in the instruction he's been given. And the Bible says he will suddenly be destroyed. Let's go to, see if I wrote it down, Hebrews 3, verses 5 and 6. Somebody could read that. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoice of the hope firm to the end. So it says Moses was faithful as a servant. So when we think about faithfulness, we don't have to get confused with high and lofty thoughts. Faithfulness is really simple. The Bible says Moses was found faithful as a servant. The Bible says the greatest among you will be the servant of all. You know one of the biggest, if maybe the biggest, maybe we may be the biggest, but one of the biggest, we can certainly say one of the biggest obstacles to being faithful is being self-seeking. When you have a decision whether or not to be faithful, whether whether to be faithful or unfaithful. Almost always, 
It's self-seeking that causes you to make a decision not to be faithful. Faithful means doing the right thing for someone else. Doing the right thing for the Lord. Doing the right thing for your wife. Doing the right thing for your children. Doing the right thing for the church. Doing the right thing for your ministry. Doing the right thing for um, your employees. Faithful means walking in integrity, doing the right thing. And what causes us to be unfaithful is self-seeking. The servant does not seek his own will. Moses was one of the greatest men ever to walk on the face of the earth. I'll say it again. Moses was one of the greatest men to walk on the face of the earth. The Bible says he was faithful. He was found faithful as a servant. Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant. And so we have these ideas of self-seeking. We have these ideas of things that we're seeking for ourselves. And those things tug at us and prevent us from being faithful. But the heart of a servant says, like Jesus said, Lord, not take this cup from me. He's showing there. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, Lord or Father, take this cup from me. He didn't want to do it. So he's showing us there he really doesn't want to do it. Inside of him there's a struggle. I don't want to. This is hard. This is, the, this is difficult. I can't do this. I don't. This is not my will. Lord. And then he says, nevertheless, Lord, I've brought to you my petition. You know what I want. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And the biggest obstacle to faithfulness is our own will. What keeps us from being faithful is our own will. I'm going to find a verse here. Philippians 2, I think verse 6. Let me get there. Actually, Philippians 2, 5. It's 2. Let's start in verse 3. Pastor Kenny, can you read starting from verse 3 and just go slowly? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Keep going. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Verse 9. Yeah. Therefore God also has exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. I think here there's some secrets to faithfulness. And when I say secrets, I just mean... I, I, I will use the word secret loosely, but what I mean by secret is there are things that are um, easy to overlook, but they're, they're right in front of us. It says, do nothing from self, motivated by selfish ambition. Or, do nothing from selfishness. Isn't that amazing? How much of what we do, and I'm, 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 I'm examining myself as I, as I read this. Nothing we do should be from selfish ambition. 
or from empty conceit. So number one, it shouldn't be to benefit you and it shouldn't be to puff you up. Do nothing, nothing. Jesus said, I do nothing but the Father's will, but what the Father has shown me. And here it says, do nothing out of selfishness. Do nothing out of motivation for yourself or empty conceit. So what are we to do if we're not supposed to do anything out of anything out of selfishness? With humility of mind. What does that mean? Regard others more important than yourselves. Do not look out merely for your personal interests, but also for the interest of others. So number one, when you make a decision, don't look out for your own interest only. Look out for the interest of others. Have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who even though he existed in the form of God, he had the right to claim equality with God, but he didn't regard that something to grasp onto. He didn't try to hold on to his position and say, well, I can have, he didn't seek a higher place. He had the highest place there was and he let it go. He emptied himself. So rather than trying to seek a higher position, he let go of his position. Taking the form of a bondservant, which is what we're to do. Take the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, he humbled himself, so humble yourself, become obedient to the point of death. Fully obedient, meaning why obedient to the point of death? Because when you say obedient, the natural response in man is how far? Obedient to what point? The Bible says obedient to the point of death. So fully obedient. And because he did this, because he humbled himself, because instead of trying to grasp for position, he let go of his position. For this reason, God highly exalted him. So he humbled himself. Remember in the beginning, he said he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death. And for this reason, God highly Exalted, So he humbled himself. The Bible says God highly exalted him. And that's how it works in the kingdom of God. If you can empty yourself, if you can put others' interests first, if you can humble yourself, God will highly exalt you. But the Bible says he resists the proud. And he makes desolate the land of the perverse, of the unfaithful. But he who humbles himself, he who empties himself, God highly exalts. But not before you become, you humble yourself, becoming obedient. So God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those that are in heaven and earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the man who humbled himself to the uttermost, to the greatest degree, God exalted to the latest, to the highest degree or the greatest degree. That's God's pattern for man. That's God's pattern for faithfulness. That we empty ourselves, we humble ourselves, we do nothing out of selfish ambition, and when we do that, God exalts us. Amen. Um, let's get. Well, we have time, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna finish the questions, which are pretty quick, and then and then we'll go into a time of discussion. Why is the earth, page 69, why is the earth filled with so many calamities? And it's a very simple answer. 
Why is there so many calamities on the earth? Why are there so many calamities? Because of the unfaithfulness of man. Unfaithfulness of man. Why? When people ask you, why is the earth, why are there so many bad things happen on earth? People will challenge you. How can God exist if there's so many bad things on the earth? And the answer is the unfaithfulness of men. It's not God's... It's not that there's no God. It's not that, that there is no... Uh, it's not that God is not watching. It's not that God doesn't care. God put man in charge of the earth. Why do so many bad things happen on the earth? Because God created man and he put man in charge of the earth and because of man's unfaithfulness we have so much calamity and because of the faithfulness of man you have restoration you have peace you have joy you have you can have life and life in abundance because of the life because of the man Jesus Christ and because of his servants who proclaim him and who teach people how to walk with him and teach people how to live according to the pattern that Jesus said. So man is the answer to why there's so, unfaithful man is the answer to why so many calamities. Number two, list five tragic calamities that are direct consequences of unfaithful men. What are five things that are calamities on the earth that are the result of unfaithful men. Divorce. Divorce. Broken, family. Broken families. Broken families. Uh, Terrorism. Pregnancies. <laughs> Terrorism. Unwanted pregnancies. Poverty. Poverty. And orphans. orphans. Somebody read Rome, uh, James one twenty seven, please. Who are the most affected or impacted <laughs> by unfaithful men? Hold on. Who are the most... Women and children. Women. Who are the most impacted and affected by unfaithful men? Women, Women and children. So we say, in what is a man, we say two-thirds of the earth. Two-thirds are most affected by the unfaithfulness of men, and that's women and children. That's why Romans one twenty one says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. True religion, the highest expression of a devotion to God, is to take care of women and children, to take care of widows and orphans. Verse 4. Uh, verse four. Question number four. What curses come upon an unfaithful man at home, at church, and community at large? Proverbs 2.22. But the wicked will be cut off from the earth, and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. So the destruction of all things. The wicked will be uprooted and? And the faithful, the, wick, the wicked will be cut off from the earth and the unfaithful will be uprooted. So the wicked will be cut off and the unfaithful will be uprooted. So the destruction of all things, the destruction of home, church, and community due to a man's unfaithfulness. So last week we tried to go down the path of having some interaction. And tonight we're going to try that again. Um, these verses that we read and these, uh, the topic that we covered has to, by necessity, has to have uh, caused you to reflect on different areas of your life. And to the extent that you're able to open up You'll be able to bless the people that are here. But to the extent that you keep it so generic that it sounds like a Sunday school answer, we will, con you know, it'll continue to feel like Sunday school discussion. So I, I would challenge you, I want to challenge you guys to be um, trying to be real with some of this stuff. Um, 
this has to have caused some reflection in your life in terms of things that need to change. One of the things Pastor said was we need to face reality tonight. This is not book knowledge. This is not a Bible study intended for you to pass a test. This is other than the test of life, which is that you take this home and you apply it. And so um, we want to open up this time. There, there's got to be a way for us, or uh, let me say this way. We need to start moving closer to a place where we're able to have legitimate interaction and legitimate um, um, exchanges here about about these issues where we're not just well we got to get past scratching the surface um, so I'm going to give someone or anyone that wants to share something an opportunity to share and uh, and we'll go from there Did this bring to mind anything for anyone? This made me realize how, how true it is that uh, every ruin upon the earth can be traced back to an unfaithful man. And it actually, it's scary how, how easy it is for that to happen for anybody, really. And it just makes you, you have to be very careful. You have to tread lightly in the decisions that you make in your life for your family, for your community, and the church. It's, it's, it's just scary how quick it is. So, I'm going to challenge you on that. You're absolutely right. You have to be careful. You're absolutely right. It's not to be taken lightly. I'll give you that. Um, the Bible tells us to be prudent. The Bible tells us to care, consider carefully how we walk. Um, but the Bible says to be strong and courageous. Um, the Bible says God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. So in God, it's not, God hasn't called us to walk in fear that we're going to mess up. God has called us to be prudent. God has called us to be prayerful, to be careful. But it's not the care of tiptoeing around scared that you're going to mess up. It's careful like a, like the Secret Service guards the president. They're not tiptoeing around hoping nobody messes with them. But they're prepared. They're making, they're courageously making sure nothing happens. So they're taking an active part in, um, in making sure that the right outcome is the result. And so uh, when David was dying and he told his sons, he told his son, be strong. And show yourself a man. So God has not called us to walk in fear. He has told us to be prudent. He has told us to give weight and responsibility to our decisions. He hasn't called us to walk in fear um, in, ter in making those decisions. He has called us to be strong, to be courageous. That's part of being a man. Um, and it's something that gets lost because our society is very careful to point out to criticize and to point out every wrong decision and to focus on all the mistakes that you make. But God hasn't called us to walk in fear. The, in the parable of the, of the uh, talents, the one guy that operated in fear is the one guy that got himself into trouble. He said, I was scared and I hid my talent. I was scared so I did nothing. And, and God and the, the, the Lord, his master said, you wicked and lazy servant. So we're not to walk around scared, we, but we are to walk around giving with a weight of responsibility for our decisions. Knowing that God backs you up, knowing that in your, your weakness, God is strong, knowing that it's by grace and, and so that you, what you said brings me to another important point. We can't do this on our own, the, at all. 
The Bible said this is not something we do in our strength. The Bible says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So you're only going to be faithful to the extent that God allows you to be. But the Bible says we need to abide in him. When he says, apart from me, you can do nothing, he's not telling you you're out of luck. He's telling you, abide in me that you might bear much fruit. So he hasn't called us to walk in fear, but he has called us to abide in him. Um, but that was good. I, I'm glad that you're, you know, reflecting on this I think, and sharing uh, it. My life um, was helped me, you know, with the faithfulness side of at least trying to be faithful has been and is walking in the faithfulness of the leaders that, that I've seen in front of me, you know? And a lot of times I feel like men think like they gotta know it all. And a lot of times that, lead us, that leads us to start sh shooting from the hip mm -hmm. and it causes huge issues, you know? And I think that, that being able to go and, and seek counsel from the men that have been faithful to, to walking with God these many years and been faithful to living with their wives, mm -hmm. you know, all these times. And it's just helped me to be able to then also carry that into my life and the way I address my family and my children. And then in return has, you know, progressed in the fruit of my faithfulness. And then my family has been able to benefit from that fruit, you know. Amen. And a lot of times I feel like you know, the Bible says that even in the areas where I might be weak, it says that God's strength is made perfect. And that his grace has been sufficient for me in those areas where I suffered. And let's say like, you know, with women, you know, God's grace has been so sufficient in my life there that now I, I feel like God has given me the victory to Amen. be able to walk knowing that I'm a warrior and that God didn't create me to be a wimp and that I have to you know, cheat on my wife. Like some men say, well, I can't live if I don't cheat on my wife. And that's, li that's a straight life in the pit of hell, you know? And I think that, that that boldness has been imparted into me from the leaders that, are, that God has surrounded me with to be able to walk in that correct charge. And then also in return, being a business owner, knowing that I'm going to go into a meeting with a woman in my office, I always bring in, you know, a guy come in there with me or somebody mm -hmm. just because... So you're not alone. Yeah. And just kind of creating barriers to help my faithfulness last, you know? Mm -hmm. And along the lines with George, uh, I, uh, I believe that that's important with, you know, who you surround yourself with, your, your friends, your leaders. And I think that... Um, men that have decided to be more self-seeking and figure this out on their own, how to live life, how to make their decisions on their own. And um, the Bible says there's a, there's a way that seems right to a man. And it might seem right. It might seem like what they're doing they, to themselves. They feel that this is the right thing to do. But at the end, the Bible says it's destruction. And we champion um, all the areas in our lives because of the people the Lord has placed around us, not to fight this alone um, and so that we can get sharpened. And I'll tell you, the, the greatest victories in my life have been a result of, of being around faithful men and being sharpened by faithful men um, and, having, and being able to enjoy the marriage I have today uh, being able to enjoy the fruit of my children uh, is a result of being sharpened by men and me taking a responsibility, not being selfish. Um, I think it's the, the total opposite is being selfless and serving. Um, and when we're, and I believe that's one of the biggest roots of, of unfaithfulness is, is being selfish. You know, and we are. We gotta learn to serve. Uh, we gotta learn to say it's not my will, Lord. It's what you want, and um, it, it, it isn't. It, it's really saying that it's not our thoughts, Lord. That your thoughts are higher than ours. Your ways are higher than our ways. It's decreasing of what we want, and it's increasing more of what the Lord wants for our lives. So it's great to come to these men's meetings and hear this and. 
it's another thing taking it and making it a reality in our life and saying, I'm going to forget and I'm going to put all my pride aside. I'm going to humble myself. I want to be teachable. I want to hear God's instruction. I want to be sharpened by those around me. And that's going to make us the man that God's calling us to be. So listening to both of you, what stood out for you, for both of you, and that I think that we can take away is if you want to be a faithful man, we're talking about making change in our lives. We're talking about going from where we are to where we're supposed to be and walking in that direction that God is directing us in. And so if we listen to Pastor Kenny, we listen to George, um, I think the takeaway is that, that for us is if you want to be a faithful man, you need to get around faithful men. You need to, so if there's a change you have to make, decide today that you're going to keep company with faithful men. And decide today that you're going to cut company with unfaithful men. And say it again. If we're going to really take this serious and we're going to make a decision and we're going to face reality, we need to decide and we need to commit. Forget decide. We need to commit to keeping company with faithful men. It's a decision that we have to make that we're going to get around men that are going to challenge us to be faithful. And if you want to be even more effective, you tell those guys, hey, I want you to start holding me accountable. I want you to sharpen me. I oh, I'm here. I'm hanging out with you because I want you to sharpen me. I want you to make me more faithful. I want you to help me grow. Um, and you give them permission to speak into your life. You invite them. Let's say it that way. You invite them to speak into your life and to and to sharpen you. Um, And that's gonna that's gonna be a blessing for you. That's gonna be uh, a blessing. You know, um, I'm a guy that does a lot of planning. My mind, the way I function, uh, in my natural in predisposition. There's some people that are very spontaneous. And I'm, I'm somebody that plans. My, my brain kind of logically puts things in order. And um, so I noticed today I was driving. Uh, this weekend I was on honeymoon with my, not honeymoon, anniversary with my wife, uh, anniversary vacation. And as we're driving back, um, I was reflecting on, on the fact that we've been married 13 years. And for 13 years, I've always had a plan. I always thought that I knew exactly what I was doing and what my next step was, et cetera, et cetera. And then I said, you know, honey, it's really funny. I've always had a plan. I always had a clear vision. But looking back, every single job I've had, every single change in my career has been somebody that it wasn't a job I applied to I think with the exception of when the Lord challenged me and I, I made a decision and that's a, that's, a, that's a story for another night but uh, um, Kenny and Pastor Kenny and I partnered up years ago um, when I first, 13 years now. <laughs> um, Two minutes. Pastor, to start a business. Uh, that was the first, that was my first job after getting married. I, when I, I left the job I was at and I partnered with Pastor Kenny, and I, not to start a business. Uh, he had already started it and I was joining him in that business. The point is that ever since that day, 13 years since I've been married, I've always had a plan, but every job, that I've ever had, I never planned it. Everybody 
every job that has come my way, I hadn't applied for. I've applied to jobs and I've never gotten them. And every job that I've taken, every career change has been somebody calling me saying, hey, I have this. Are you interested? Here's my point. I didn't go after them. I didn't even know it existed. I, it wasn't, so I had a plan. My plans in 13 years have never materialized. And the Lord has done in my life, every single step of the way has been out of my control. Because I don't know it's around, it's the phone call you don't know you're gonna receive. It's not a, you make 100 phone calls and one of them goes through. It's the phone call you didn't make. And so, um, here's my point. For all these years, I've, I've had a plan and I was kind of working, trying to be faithful with what I thought I was supposed to be doing. And now I'm in this place where I'm like, the Lord led me to make a decision in my career that where I don't see the plan. I've got no plan. I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm here in obedience, but I really don't see the next step. I don't see the progression. I don't know what I'm doing here other than the fact that I think you have me here. Um, and it made me realize how up until now, I was always executing my plan. And now that I'm at a place where the plan is not mine and I'm just sitting there saying, all right, Lord, what do you want me to do? Um, I lost a little bit. Not, not, I didn't have clarity in, in, what I'm, in what I'm supposed to be doing where I'm at because now this is not my plan. And so now this, this chapter is allowing me to look at things from a different lens and say, um, Lord, how, do I, how can I be faithful with somebody else's plan? Because this is not my plan. How, Lord, how can I be faithful with someone else's plan? And um, and that's what you know. That, that's the challenge, or that's the th the thing that I'm reflecting on now. Is um, I've always been a good employee, but within that employee structure, you know, I've gotten, but but with always done what they've asked me to do. But within that structure, it was always there was always a a plan around my career. Where now there's no plan. So now, Lord, how can I be faithful as a servant? How can I be faithful with somebody else's plan? And so it's an interesting dynamic now, um, you know, that, I, that I'm, I'm getting to wrestle with or getting to, to learn. It's a, it's a learning process as I seek out the Lord's face and see what, what the next steps are. Um, so it's a learning process for me too. So amen. Let's get out there. Pastor gave us a two-minute warning.
se ha dicho y es súper importante and, and it's the paradigm uh, that's crazy ready for this listo in regards to a faithful man con respecto a un hombre fiel if it is considered faithful it's not a man si se considera fiel entonces no es hombre and if it's considered a man it's not faithful y si es hombre entonces ese no es fiel and that's the paradigm of our natural existence. Y ese es el paradigma de nuestra existencia natural. What's that mean? ¿Qué significa? We're almost expected to not be faithful. Que se espera de nosotros, casi que se espera que no seamos fieles. Almost in every setting, the people are like, well, he's not going to make it. Casi en todo ámbito la gente dice, bueno, ese no lo va a lograr. And the reality of the question is, how many payments on your house can you miss? Y la realidad de la pregunta es cuántos pagos de tu hipoteca tú puedes fallar. And the answer is none. Y la respuesta es ninguno. Because if you miss one, the house is taken from you. Porque si pierdes un pago te quitan la casa. It doesn't matter if you've been paying it faithfully for 10 years. No importa si la llevas pagando fielmente 10 años. My cousin was paying his house for 15 years. Mi primo pagó su casa 15 años. And he stopped paying it. Y lo dejó de pagar. And they, somebody came and took it from him. Y alguien vino y le quitó la casa. The house was worth more than 500,000. La casa valía más de medio millón de dólares. It was right behind Baptist Hospital. Atr atrás de Baptist Hospital. I don't know if it was a couple of acres. Yo no sé si era unos... Dos acres. But he had been paying it for 15 years. Pero por 15 años lo estuvo pagando. And he stopped paying it. Y la dejó de pagar. And I saw how that house was taken. Y yo vi como esa casa se le, quita, se le fue quitada. The man who paid for the foreclosure. El hombre que pagó el foreclosure. Was super kind. Fue bien bondadoso. And he allowed my cousin and his wife and kids to live in the house for one year. Y permitió que... Eh, eh, mi, mis primos vivieran en su casa un año Rent free. sin pagar eh, hipoteca o, o alquiler in porque él estaba recibiendo 500 mil dólares del valor de la casa was he being kind? él estaba siendo bondadoso no, he was being a cannibal. no estaba siendo un caníbal But all the result of my cousin's unfaithfulness. pero fue el resultado de la infidelidad de mi eh, primo. How many car payments can you miss? ¿Cuántos pagos del carro puedes fallar? Is anybody in the car industry? ¿Alguien está en la industria de carros? They say maybe three months. Dicen que tres meses. Unless it's one of the cannibals. A menos que sea un caníbal. And if you're late one day. Y si estás tarde un día. It doesn't matter how much you've paid. No importa cuánto has pagado. It doesn't matter if it's worth ten thousand dollars and you only owe a thousand more. No importa si vale diez mil dólares y solo debes mil dólares te van a quitar el carro and they will not you five years you've been y no te van a reembolsar los cinco años que has pagado If you don't pay your bill, si no pagas tu luz how much time do they give you? la cuenta de la luz cuánto tiempo te dan I know some men here. yo sé que hay varios hombres con experiencia aquí When the lights go out, cuando apagan la luz and they say, Holy mackerel. y dicen alabado What happened? ¿Qué pasó? You didn't pay your light bill. Que no pagaste la cuenta. You don't live in Cuba, Santo Domingo, or Venezuela. No vives ni en Cuba, ni Santo Domingo, ni Venezuela. They asked Pastor Medieros when we first started going to missions to Mexico. Cuando comenzamos a ir a las misiones en México. They thought it was a third world country. Pensaban que era un país tercer mundista. They said, when do the lights go out? Y le preguntaron, ¿y cuándo se vienen los apagones de las luces? Says, When you don't pay your bill. Y él dice, cuando no pagas la cuenta. Así que, ¿cuántas veces tú fallas en pagar tu luz, tu electricidad, tu Before hipoteca? It's taken away. Antes de que se te quite. Now I'm gonna ask you this question. Ahora te voy a hacer esta pregunta. How many times could you miss church? ¿Cuántas veces puedes fallar la iglesia? How many times do you think you can miss church and you're still invited to come back with una cara de descarado? 
¿Cuántas veces piensas que puedes fallar la iglesia y sigues siendo invitado a regresar con una cara de descarado? Como si no hubieras hecho nada malo. Y la verdad es que eres un fugitivo. Eres un delincuente. Eres un degenerado. Porque hay familias ahí y no están contando con el predicador. Un hombre vino a esta iglesia a wealthy man in this city. Un hombre con dinero en esa ciudad. And when he came in, I said, okay, this has to be my best sermon. Y cuando él entró, yo dije, bueno, este tiene que ser mi mejor sermón. And I thought it was based on my faithfulness. Y yo pensé que se trataba de mi fidelidad. And when I talked to him after the service, y cuando hablé con él después de servicio, I said, so how did you like my sermon? Le pregunté, bueno, ¿qué te pareció mi sermón? He goes, I really wasn't paying attention. Y me dijo, bueno, no estaba prestando atención. I was noticing everybody that was here sitting down. Yo me estaba fijando en todos los que estaban aquí sentados. And I'm going to stay in this church. Y me voy a quedar en esta iglesia. Because of the faithfulness of the Men, women, and children who come here. Por la fidelidad de los hombres, las mujeres y los niños que vienen and aquí. And it had nothing to do with the sermon. Y no tenía nada que ver con el A sermón. A lot of times we're worried about the sermon or the music. Muchas veces nos preocupamos preocupamos del sermón o la música. And people are worried about you. Pero la gente está preocupado por ti. Because you're the church. Porque tú eres la iglesia. You represent the body of Christ. Tú representas el cuerpo de Cristo. Either we're serious about God. O estamos en serio con Dios or we're a bunch of clowns. o somos una pila de payasos no one is invited to be part of the church of Jesus Christ y, to be a clown y nadie es invitado a formar parte de la iglesia de Cristo para ser un payaso because outside it doesn't say greatest show on earth a circus porque afuera no estamos anunciando un circo and we're not inviting clowns ni invitamos a los payasos there are broken men hay hombres quebrantados every single one of us I tell you cada uno de nosotros nosotros te los dice. Have suffered severely Hemos sufrido severamente because of an unfaithful man in our lives. Por causa de un hombre infiel en nuestra One vida. of the men called his father. Uno de los hombres llamó su papá. And he says, y le dijo, Dad, papá, I will never forgive you. Yo nunca te voy a perdonar. That you did not take me to church. Que tú no me llevaste a la iglesia. Because the devil came into my house and stole my greatest treasure. Porque el diablo vino, entró a mi hogar y me robó mi mayor tesoro. Who are those men? ¿Quiénes son esos hombres? It's us. Nosotros. We are depriving our children. Nosotros estamos robando a nuestros hijos. From knowing el conocer that God doesn't need us. que Dios no nos necesita We need God. nosotros necesitamos a Dios y para tú enseñarle a tu familia que tú no necesitas a Dios and you come to church when you feel good. y vienes a la iglesia cuando te sientes bien and when everything is good. y cuando todo está perfecto I want you to call your work tomorrow. yo quiero que llames al trabajo mañana and say, I didn't feel like coming in today. y dile yo no quise venir hoy How many times can you ¿Cuántas veces tú puedes fallar before you get a permanent vacation? Antes de que te inviten a una vacación permanente. In your work. En tu lugar de empleo. So why did you think that the house of God is less? Entonces, ¿por qué tú piensas que la casa de Dios es diferente? And how many times could you miss during a year? ¿Y cuántas veces puedes fallar en un año? Before you get a pink, what's it called? A pink slip. Antes de que te despiden. My friend. Mi amigo. You have hit the mark of excellence Tú le has dado la marca de la excelencia. like me Como yo. when I was coaching my kids in basketball Cuando estaba entrenando mis hijos en el baloncesto. they said Joaquin, le dijeron, Joaquin you had a perfect season tuviste una temporada perfecta. you didn't win one game no ganaste ni un juego. Are you getting a prize because you miss so much? Te están dando un premio por fallar tanto? Are you trying to say that you are that man who could come and go when you please? Estás tratando de decir que tú eres el hombre que puede llegar y dejar de venir Can you do that in quieres? an army? Lo puedes hacer en el ejército? Can you do that in a sporting event? Lo puedes hacer en un equipo de deporte? And so this is the hallmark of the 
topic tonight. Así que este es el tema esta noche. And I can tell you the only thing I know how to do. Y le puedo decir que lo único que yo sé hacer. Is say God have mercy on me. Y decir Dios ten misericordia de mí. And make me a faithful man. Y hazme un hombre fiel. I want to be faithful. Yo quiero ser fiel. And 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 if I'm going to miss, if I'm going to fall, if I'm going to slip, it's going to be it's not going to be intentional. Y si yo voy a fallar o yo voy a, a, a no darle al blanco no va a ser intencionalmente there are some things that cause us to be unfaithful. hay cosas que nos causan ser infiel there are other priorities. otras prioridades other pursuits. otras cosas que estamos buscando other things of lesser value. otras cosas de menor valor y te, di te digo la verdad y mi hijo lo dijo el Domingo por la he mañana. Says a lot of things could happen in life. Y él dijo muchas cosas pueden suceder en la vida. I could be a successful law student. Puedo ser un estudiante de leyes. I could have a bright career. Exitoso y tener una carrera estelar. I could make a lot of money. Y ganar mucho dinero. But I never want to lose my place in the house of God. Pero nunca quiero perder mi lugar en la casa de Dios. I don't want to lose my place. No quiero perder mi lugar. In being faithful to my Lord. En serle fiel a mi Señor. Father, thank you. Padre, gracias. For this day. Por este día. We've set it apart. Le hemos separado. To consider what you desire. Para considerar lo que tú deseas. You are looking for faithful men. Tú estás buscando hombres fieles. That's not us. Ese no son nosotros. Without no somos Jesus nosotros. Christ, Sin Jesucristo, we can never be faithful in anything. Nunca podemos ser fieles en nada. But because of Christ, Pero a causa de Cristo, and because of the work on the cross, y a causa de la obra en la cruz, all those that are in Christ, todos los que están en Cristo, are new creations. Son nueva criatura. New men. Hombres nuevos. With our our, our Our, our goal is set donde nuestra meta está puesta on the high price en el alto llamado of the call in Christ el, Jesus al, el premio alto del llamado en Cristo this calling to be faithful el llamado de ser fiel your spirit is able tu espíritu es capaz your grace is sufficient tu gracia es suficiente do this work haz esta obra in our lives en nuestra vida that we might be faithful para ser fiel to be able to fulfill your pleasure para cumplir tu And that your glory, y que tu gloria, the manifestation of your character, la manifestación de tu carácter, will sweep the nations. Eh, cubra las naciones. That will sweep our city. Y cubra nuestra ciudad. That will sweep our friends and family. Y cubra nuestras familias y nuestros When they say amigos. There are no serious Christians. Cuando dicen que no hay cristianos en serio. There are no serious men. Que no hay hombres serios. We can raise our hands. Podemos levantar nuestras and manos. And say, follow my example. Y decir, sigue mi ejemplo. Imitate me. Imítame a mí. As I imitate Christ. En lo que yo imito a Cristo. In Jesus name. En el nombre de Jesús oramos. Amen and amen. amen, y amen. Give five guys a high five. Dale cinco. Say thank. Thank God you're a man. Thank God you're a man. God.